The following story is one that was forgotten and then rediscovered. When the writings of Roman historian Tacitus were found in the 15th century, this David versus Goliath tale was among them. The principal sources are a few different Roman historians, some contemporary, some a few decades or a few centuries later. None were present for these events. So while I recount these events in what is the generally accepted narrative, keep in mind that we're dealing with non-primary sources here. Nonetheless, the Roman historians have another, more recent source that seems to back up their stories quite well. And that source is archaeology. My principal source is the archaeologist Peter S. Wells. The ongoing discoveries buried beneath the 2,000 years of soil are without a doubt the most comprehensive and affirmative evidence that tells us what in the hell happened to the 20,000 Roman legions in the dark forests of ancient Germany. As I said, it's a David and Goliath story, and our Goliath is the Roman Empire, fresh off the victorious conquest of Gaul and shrewdly run by Caesar Augustus. But when this perfect military machine comes face to face with an act of perfect betrayal, the subject of our story will show the world that even Rome can bleed. In The Godfather Part 2, Tom Hagen is visiting Frank Pentangeli in jail. And the two reminisce about history, Rome, and the heyday of their crime family. And at one point, Pantangeli says, quote, Those were the great old days. We was like the Roman Empire. The Corleone family was like the Roman Empire. End quote. The end of these glory days are shown at the beginning of The Godfather Part 1, with the family at its peak of its power and its decadence, and a new generation is ready to take the reins of control from their beloved father. And in an iconic, unforgettable, brilliant opening to a movie, through the framework of a wedding reception, the story of how much power the family wields is told. The FBI shows up to harass the party goers, but their cameras are fearlessly smashed to the ground by Sonny, the hothead. And tens of thousands of dollars is showered upon the new bride and groom. And being a party of criminals, this exchange of cash doesn't go unnoticed, but they wouldn't dare steal from the Godfather. And in his benevolence, the Godfather himself deigns to grant an audience to those desperately seeking his justice over societies. All they have to do is kiss the ring. Even the deadly assassin, Luca Brazzi, nervously does him homage. But, as we all know, this veneer of Invictus comes crashing down when the Godfather is gunned down in the streets of New York. And for the rest of the film, the cracks in the crime family are painfully revealed. The Corleone family, that which was like the Roman Empire, can also bleed. We don't know the real name of the subject of this podcast. All we have is his Roman name, Arminius. But Arminius is not Roman at all. His father, Segamir, was the chief of the Cherusci tribe, one of many Germanic tribes occupying the land east of the Rhine around the time of Christ, and for millennia prior. The Romans called these people barbarians, but that's simply the name that Romans applied to anybody who made them a little nervous. Ever since hordes of barbarians looted the city of Rome itself, roughly 400 years prior to what we're discussing now, they as a people always had a bit of post-traumatic stress, you could say, woven into their culture. And the fear of the hordes of the north persisted through their generations. But by the time Arminius is born, roughly 
17 BC, Gaul, which is modern-day France, was conquered, pacified, and enveloped into the Roman Empire. Germania was the next domino to fall, geopolitically. The Rhine was literally the eastern edge of the empire, and up and down that river border, forts and barracks were erected, housing thousands of Roman frontier soldiers. And while these soldiers likely harbored a certain amount of fear from the mysterious barbarians across the river, archaeological evidence shows a lot of commercial, cultural, and military crossovers in this border region. Years earlier, when Julius Caesar first crossed the Rhine whilst conquering Gaul, he encountered these mysterious people who emerged like spirits from the dark woods. Not knowing what perils lay behind their tree line, he retreated back across the Rhine in lieu of fighting them, and he actually ended up hiring them in his fight against the Gauls. Of their culture, Caesar says, quote, Their whole life is composed of hunting expeditions and military pursuits. From early boyhood, they are zealous for toil and hardship. For agriculture, they have no zeal, and the greater part of their food consists of milk, cheese, and flesh. End quote. The Iron Age Germanic people, at the time of their interaction with the Roman Empire, had little political structure and zero centralized authority. But they did have an organized society that worked for them. There were hundreds of tribes, and each tribe had potentially hundreds of villages. Each village was composed of probably no more than 30 or so people, and rested likely not more than a mile from each other, from the next village. The small villages of short, sturdy houses along the riverbank would have been primarily made up of extended family under the auspices of a patriarch. And in times of war, the village patriarchs would come together in a council and nominate warlords, not unlike the Roman traditions of dictators. With such close proximity between these communities that dotted the landscape, news must have traveled very, very fast, much faster than Rome could have ever expected. There's archaeological evidence showing that these villages would band together for larger infrastructure projects, too. Entire roadways were built across huge bogs, one recently discovered still preserved in the acidic water stretched almost a mile, and it required the lumber from some 3,000 trees. In warfare, and much unlike the Romans, the Germanic battlefield was dark, dank, and close. Bogs, marshes, and old forests were ideal for quick lightning attacks and then vanishing into the shadows. By the time Rome entered Germania, the locals had been forging iron weapons for over 700 years, but they didn't mine it, at least not in the typical sense. They harvested it from deposits left over from bogs and streams of Germany. These ingots of iron are known as bog ore, and it could easily be found simply lying around or very near the Earth's surface. And from this raw resource, they produced hard steel axes, spears, and huge longswords. To date, the oldest set of European chainmail was discovered in Germany in a 62-foot-long sunken boat, along with swords, javelins, shields, and lances. This weapons cache dated back to about 350 BC and could have armed up to some 80 men. Weapons were so important to these Germanic warriors that they were often buried with them. Typically, the dead would be burned atop a pyre, with the closest family member igniting the blaze. The charred bones would then be placed in a container and buried, and the recently departed sword would be bent and placed alongside the remains so that it too would die with its former master. After 51 BC, when Julius Caesar began hiring the Germanic tribes, archaeological evidence shows an increase of Roman spears being included in these grave sites. And this is a clear indication of Germanic recruitment into the Roman auxiliary units. And as a Roman auxiliary, these spurs were a potent status symbol back at home. As Germanic integration into Roman military life increased, so too did trade. In exchange for German leather, fur, dairy, beer, cider, the Romans traded them their glassware, their beads, their pottery, silver and copper coinage. And around 15 BC, Rome began beefing up its military posts along the Rhine, and one could even argue they conquered Germany. But that really needs an asterisk next to it. I'm oversimplifying this by quite a bit, but in the end, all Rome really did was demonstrate that they could march their legions at will through Germany. 
They did build forts and barracks, but the people never really considered themselves to be Roman or even conquered, really. They were just occupied. Nonetheless, diplomatic relationships took shape between Rome and the chiefs of the various Germanic tribes. During the reign of Caesar Augustus, the most powerful among the tribes were the Cherusci, and their chief was Segamir. It's unclear why or how, but around the year AD 1, Segamir's 18-year-old son joined the Roman Auxiliary Force. His name was Arminius. Once in Rome, and likely due to his status as a Germanic prince, Arminius was trained to be a Roman military leader. He learned Roman Latin, Roman military tactics, Roman politics, Roman etiquette, Roman horsemanship, and he even attained the status of equestrian, which is basically a Roman knight. Astride a steed galloping down some marbled, paved Roman road, draped in crimson, gilded with gold, and topped with a plumed helmet, this barbarian from the north would have looked, sounded, and strutted like a Roman commander. Only in his own heart was he still German, a vestigial organ of his heritage known to none but Arminius. But as the saying goes, when in Rome. As the leader of his own auxiliary unit, Arminius probably had around a thousand men under his command, most of whom were likely Germanic. He and his men had the opportunity to finally prove their worth to Emperor Augustus when groups of auxiliary units in the Balkans rose up in rebellion. For four years, Arminius fought to suppress and defeat these rebels, and perhaps along the way he also took notes. While Arminius is building his reputation as an asset to the Roman auxiliaries in the Balkans, another man was making a name for himself in Judea. Publius Quintilius Verus was a man who was deeply and confusingly entwined in the imperial family of Rome through marriage and his mother's pedigree. Without getting into the genealogical weeds too much, what's important to know is that he knew emperors Augustus and Tiberius personally. By 8 BC, Varus is the governor over the province of Africa, and then around 7 BC, he gets promoted to the governor of Judea. Varus's ruthlessness as governor of Judea became theologically significant, as he is the man oppressing the Jews at the opening of the New Testament. After a Jewish rebellion is put down, Varus orders the crucifixion of 2,000 captured Jews. From the viewpoint of Rome, Varus's brutality appeared to be working. Judea was pacified, mission accomplished. The Roman Empire at this time was ruled by its first emperor, and I think the ultimate executive, Caesar Augustus. He had consolidated and restructured Romans' armies to about 300,000 strong, half legionnaires, half auxiliaries. And it was an army built for conquest and occupation to wrangle more happy taxpayers into Roman glory. The legions were huge military units, roughly 6,000 strong apiece, and Augustus had around 28 of them. They were made up of heavily armed and highly trained career soldiers who rarely broke rank. To ensure such loyalty... They had special forms of military justice, keeping cowardice to a minimum. You no doubt often hear the word decimation. Well, its literal translation from Latin means, quote, removal of the tenth. If a portion of a cohort, roughly 480 men, proved dishonorable in battle, the cohort would suffer this removal of the tenth, meaning every tenth man would be beaten to death. Whether or not they had part in the offense didn't really matter. It was simply an effective deterrent. The enemies of this formidable army were usually poorly equipped, inadequately organized, and far less trained. Fearsome must have been the sight of the slow flood of the huge crimson and gold phalanx of the legions coming towards them. Their helmets glinted in the sun, their officers' plumes waved in the wind, and their enormous curved body shields formed a moving wall of iron and wood. Each shield at its center had a metal protrusion that would be used to thrust an enemy soldier off his feet. Moving in tight formation, the Roman army in an open field must have been a magnificent sight to behold, even for the soon-to-be annihilated enemy combatant. The typical peasant soldier rarely got such glimpses of the ancient world. And so, imagine for a moment, you are this peasant soldier. It's raining on the battlefield, and your heavy woolen and leather boots are waterlogged, muddy, itching and weighing you down but the enemy romans marching towards you 
They're suited with sturdy leather sandals, unencumbered by the rain, and when the rain stops and the sun comes out, it instantly dries their feet, but not yours. As the Roman legions close the gap of no man's land, your archers behind you might let loose a volley of arrows to soften the lines before the melee phase of the battle commences. But as the arrows reach the peak of their arc, the centurions shout something in Latin, and those huge body shields of the legions raise up in the air and cover each man in front of them like an umbrella. It's the testudo formation, meaning tortoise. Once the arrows cease, the shields drop, and the march of the legions continues towards you, totally unfazed by your arrows. Once they get within about 50 feet of you, the plumed centurions again shout in Latin, and the legionnaires rear back their long wooden spears with iron spikes on the front of them. Those are also known as pylums, and they hurl them in the air towards your men. And this barrage of heavy pylums, it pierces both armor and shield. And if your shield was durable enough to withstand the force of these projectiles, it's now useless having a six-foot iron and wooden rod stuck in it. You might get the brilliant idea to grab a pylum from the writhing body of one of your compatriots. Maybe you can throw it back at the Romans and give them a taste of their own medicine. But only to find that the front of the spear, the iron part, it was made with a specific delicateness that allowed it to bend in half upon hitting its target, rendering it useless to you. You, being one of the lucky ones, still stood while those on all sides lay dead from the pylum volley. You hear more Latin, but closer now, and before you know it, that wall of shield suddenly picks up in pace and crashes into your lines. You swing your sword, but it bounces off the heavy Roman shields, and then you're suddenly smashed to the ground like a rag doll by the metal butt protruding from an enemy shield. And as you struggle to recover yourself, to find your sword and your breath that was knocked out of you, you notice your ribs are broken, and you look up at the phalanx of shields smashing its way forward, and in between each coordinated shield thrust, a short sword, also known as a gladius, jabs like a sting of a hornet, stabbing your friends at the front of the line in the gut. The swords then retract behind the phalanx, and the shields again clobber back your line. And like a bloody concerto of military perfection, synchronous and rhythmic, the shields and the swords alternate, smashing and stabbing, each time chewing away at your army's position on the battlefield. And each Roman step treads on the broken and bleeding bodies of your fallen brothers, smothering the life out of them into the mud. Unable to stem the meat grinder that is the Roman legions, your commander orders a retreat, but before your army can even comply, the Roman cavalry bursts into the midst of your panic-stricken army, swinging with a band in huge longswords, sending heads and limbs flying into the air. You and your brothers flee in terror from that certain death and make for another escape, but you're stopped cold by the sudden appearance of another group of Roman infantrymen who are a bit more wild and a bit more untamed. And though they bear similar weapons and armor as the legionnaires, they look a lot more like you. They are the Roman auxiliaries. This is how Rome conquered the known world. And this is the army that pacified Judea, and this is the army that had been campaigning against the Germans for decades. It was, as author Peter S. Wells puts it, the product of a, quote, urban, literate, Mediterranean society, end quote. Quintilius Verus's reputation for hard, swift, decisive action against rustic insurgents made him Augustus's perfect man for the job in Germania. He was, in fact, the first official governor of the new province. And in AD 7, Verus takes his new post of that province. About the same time, Arminius and his auxiliaries were likewise reassigned to Germany. It can't be said exactly why, but I think it's a fair guess to make that having the son of a chieftain of the most powerful tribe in Germany would probably be a useful asset. Though Arminius was raised in this strange country, he has no doubt proven his loyalty to Rome. Varus' main fort in Germany was probably the site of Xanten on the banks of the Rhine in northern Germany. Upon arrival, he would have found a mini wooden city, complete with barracks and workshops, hospitals, guard towers, blacksmiths, pottery shops, and residences. The soldiers themselves, at least a good number of them, would have taken local women for wives and probably started families. And through Arminius, 
Varus would have been put in contact with Segamir, his father, and leader of the Cherusky tribe, who enjoyed preferred status by the Romans. According to Peter S. Wells, Varus even entertained the father and son duo at his own dinner table. For Arminius's part, his return to Germany would have been something like the prodigal son. Now at the age of 25, decorated in Roman armor and civilized by the Roman way of life, he would have enjoyed special status, and he was the single best intermediary between the two civilizations, between a people occupied and their occupiers. Quintilius Varus was given five legions to govern Germany with, a little less than one-fifth of the entire Roman legionary force. His mission was a clear one, establish Roman system of governance, Roman census-taking, and Roman taxation. Arminius, as leader of the local Germanic auxiliary force, would have likely be given the duty of recruiting the other tribes in Germania to conforming to Roman rule of law. To do this, he would be required to spend a great deal of time back among his own people, conversing with them, learning from them, and reconnecting with his ancestral inheritance, yet all the while advancing Roman interest. And over the course of about two years, as far as Varus knew, he was doing just that. In the fall of AD 9, Arminius returned from northern Germany with an urgent message for Varus. The tribes to the north were in full rebellion against the empire, and his auxiliaries alone could not contain them. Varus characteristically opted for swift and decisive action by mobilizing three entire legions, roughly 18,000 men, for a campaign against these rebels. Arminius probably recommended the quickest route through the dense, marshy Teutoburg Forest, a road that Varus and most of his legions had likely never traveled before. A Roman army on the march was truly a moving city. The three legions, the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th, all had approximately 6,000 infantry, cavalry, officers, but plus another couple thousand supporting staff, um, family members, women, children, servants, beasts of burden, baggage carts and carriages. Each legionary, in addition to his 70 pounds of weaponry and armor, carried another 40 pounds of cooking gear and personal items. At the head of each marching legion were two standard bearers, both either donning lion skin or bear skins. One carried a banner identifying the specific legion, the other held a staff bearing the golden eagle of the Roman Empire, its talons gripping lightning bolts. It's estimated that this force of around 20,000 personnel would have stretched for around at least two miles on the open road, but probably longer than that. The front and rear of the columns would have been guarded by the auxiliary units, and then on both sides moving inward would be the legions, and then in the very middle of the march would be the general staff and baggage carts. As they marched north, the landscape became increasingly wild. To the left of their road, the woods grew denser and darker, and to the right, the marshes grew larger, closer, and more ominous. Varus like all Roman commanders, knew his army's strength lay in open field combat, and thus would do his best to stay out of the woods. Thankfully, his scouts and local intelligence had told him that the road would soon present his force with a path that would split to the right, northward, through the marshes and away from the Teutoburg Forest. But upon reaching this fork, the path to the right suddenly dropped below the waterline, flooded by the bog. The road, out of the forest, just simply didn't exist anymore. So Varus now had two options, continue through the Teutoburg Forest or turn back. He may have estimated that there was actually very little to fear in Germania at this time. It was, after all, a conquered and pacified province, and he had 18,000 soldiers with him. On top of this, an open rebellion in his province must not be tolerated. And so, into the Teutoburg Forest they went. To say that they were traveling by road is probably a bit generous here. It was something more of a deer path, more wild and untamed, and it became increasingly narrow as the forest landscape gradually rose to the left, forming a huge hill known as Calcris Hill. And to the right, the marshes grew darker as they themselves became enmeshed into the woods. Before Varus and his legions knew it, they were deep in the Teutoburg Forest, pinched on both sides by the landscape. Then, as Cassius Dio tells us, 
came terrible storms. Quote, the mountains had an uneven surface, broken by ravines, and the trees grew close together and very high. Hence the Romans, even before the enemy assaulted them, were having a hard time of it felling trees, building roads, and bridging places that required it. They had with them many wagons and beasts of burden, as in a time of peace. Moreover, not a few women and children, and a large retinue of servants. Meanwhile, a violent wind and rain came up that separated them still further, while the ground that had become slippery around the roots and logs made walking very treacherous for them, and the tops of trees kept breaking off and falling down, causing much confusion. End quote. You have to imagine this agonizing situation of being caught in the cold, wet, muddy road of an unknown and ancient forest. The trees are literally falling around you from the winds, and paths that are supposed to exist are mysteriously gone. But only the vanguard of this force really knows all this. The rear guard is still trickling into the forest miles behind, totally unaware of how miserable the situation is getting. As they sludge on, they encounter another seemingly natural anomaly with which to contend. The road between the forest and the bogs is gradually being constricted by a strangely uniform earthen wall along the forest side of the road. As they march, this mound, roughly 5 feet high and 15 feet wide, tightens and tightens against the road for some 2,000 feet, so that at one point the Roman soldiers are only able to march six men abreast. Just like how traffic jams are caused when a highway loses a lane to construction, this choke brings the rear guard to a halt as they wait for the vanguard and the baggage carts to navigate through this very long bottleneck. But suddenly, a thundering roar erupts in the forest near the rear guard of the army. The cavalry and auxiliaries look up into the dark woods of the Calcris Hill to where this inhuman clamor is coming from. But before they can even begin to process what's happening, it starts raining spears. Some soldiers may have been saved by their armor at first, but not all. Author Peter S. Wells describes the scene, quote, Other spears found their marks directly. Some landed in the soldiers' faces, some in their necks, others in their legs or arms. The armor of the helmet and cuirass were designed to protect the legionary in infantry combat, not against intensive barrages of sharp projectiles traveling with deadly energy gained by falling from a high arc or being hurled powerfully at body level. The shrieks of agony as spear points penetrated the flesh quickly drowned out the lesser sound of spears hitting armor and shields. Wounded soldiers fell to the ground, many gushing blood and screaming or moaning in pain. End quote. As the dead piled up, an estimated 7,000 Germans descended the hill to take advantage of the chaos that they had wrought. Quintilius Varus and his commanders may have perceived that a skirmish might be occurring at the rear, but he couldn't have known to what extent. In such a tight, muddy corridor, it would have been nearly impossible for riders to carry news back and forth. But he wouldn't have had to wait long to worry about the rear guard, as the vanguard soon erupted in sounds of battle. From the other side of that mounded wall that was squeezing the legion's march to a choke point, wild barbarians emerged and hurled spears at the petrified soldiers. Wells continues, quote, The cavalry horses were terrified at the sudden eruption of battle sounds, the clanking of metal points hitting armor, and the screaming of men. When a spear landed in the flesh of a horse, the animal shrieked in pain and bolted, throwing its rider and charging off into the swamp, often trampling men in its path. Wounded mules tore off, jerking their wagons along, crashing into and bowling over soldiers until the mules broke loose from their harness or collapsed in panicked exhaustion. Most wounded animals that dashed into the marshes became trapped in the deep mud and weakened by a loss of blood soon drowned. Others charged in panic into the ranks of troops, trampling and wounding many men. A few in their terror and distortion bolted towards the woods, attempting to scale the brush-covered wall, often falling back into the ditch to die there of their wounds. End quote. After the volley of spears had ceased, somewhere around 10,000 Germans who waited patiently atop the Calcris Hill tore down the slope, wild, shouting, and swinging their huge longswords. Sitting back and doing some math on these numbers, Wells estimates that because a man can throw a spear accurately about every four seconds, and based on the number of Germans that were hiding there in the woods, that an estimated 25,000 spears were thrown at the Romans in the span of about 20 seconds. It just, it would have been sheer carnage. In just a few short seconds, Varus's legions, 
the 17th, the 18th, and the 19th, expertly trained, armored and armed with the best military technology available, had fallen into a state of complete pandemonium. Your average Roman soldier, he required five square yards to operate properly, to maneuver his shields, to form a phalanx, and to throw his pilum. And most importantly, he needed the man next to him to be doing the same thing. He needed the decisive commands from his centurion, and he needed them unified, coordinated, and in that concerto of Roman military expertise. Without these things, he was simply alone and helpless. In this compact situation, the Romans' huge shields were of no use. And now armed with only their two-foot-long gladius, which is deadly in a phalanx, it was like a child's toy against the German longswords that were at least four feet long. Somewhere up on Calcris Hill, in the ancient dark woods of Germany, stood Arminius, looking on. His plan had worked perfectly. Ever since his return and reunification with his Cherusky tribe, and with his father, their chief, he had successfully patched together a secret tribal alliance against Rome, all while not only maintaining a position of respect in Varus's eyes, but also gaining his absolute trust. Under Varus's nose, Arminius had organized a massive earthworks campaign, building a wall of sod and limestone five feet high, 15 feet wide, and 2,000 feet long, and covered it with plants and debris, camouflaging it into the forest environment. He had flooded the only road out of the marshy woods, and he had convinced Quintilius Varus to walk himself and 20,000 Roman soldiers into his trap two years in the making. And now, he watched his trap close shut. Peter S. Wells, reflecting on what Germans must have thought at the unfolding disaster for the Romans, says, quote, For the first time in their lives, they saw Roman legionaries, representatives of the imperial power, that marched with impunity through their lands, bribing their chiefs, and subverting their politics, powerless and helpless. End quote. After the first hour of combat, it's likely that around 5,000 Romans were already dead, with another 10,000 laying on the ground with mortal wounds. According to Cassius Dio, Varus was able to organize some sort of makeshift encampment, probably made out of wagons and carts, where the survivors from the first day of combat spent a very uneasy night. On the second day, knowing the situation to be untenable, Varus and his men made for a desperate dash out of the woods, only to be attacked by Arminius' forces again. Now hungry cold and sleep deprived some of the soldiers began shedding their roman armor and clothing and flee to the woods or the marshes where they would eventually be done in by the elements varus's second in command a man named pneumonius valla fled the field in an attempt to escape with a group of cavalry towards the rhine but only to be welcomed with open arms and sharp swords by another band of barbarians anticipating their route of escape Hundreds of men tried to flee through the marshes, but became stuck in the mire, some up to their waist, others up to their necks, making them fun targets for the Germans. Some were unlucky enough to be taken alive, but most of Varus's general staff, knowing full well what sort of ritualistic tortures awaited them to please the German deities, opted instead to fall on their swords. Quintilius Varus, seeing the hopelessness of his situation, did likewise. Following the tradition of Roman leaders before him, who also suffered defeat, he fell forward and impaled himself with his sword. The golden eagles and the standards of the 17th, 18th, and 19th legions were captured, though legend says that one brave standard bearer hid one of the eagles somewhere in the swamp. By the end of the third day of the battle, the Teutoburg forest fell quiet. In the days following that battle, the Germans tended to their wounded and dead, which would have been relatively few compared to the Romans, whose bodies they left to rot where they lay on the forest floor. The site of the battle became something of a sacred temple for the Germans, and they adorned it with the bones of the dead legions. The trees they decorated with Roman heads fastened to the trunks by spikes through the eyes. Those unfortunate enough to be taken alive were offered as sacrifices to the Germanic gods, 
Some were brought to makeshift altars where they had their throats slashed. Others were sacrificed in groves of oak trees or hanged from oak trees. The oak was spiritually significant to the ancient Germans, second only to black marshes. And at the side of these dark pools, Roman throats were drained into the water, and then the lifeless bodies were cast in where they would be perfectly preserved for thousands of years at the bottom of these acidic pools. According to archaeologists, these rituals had been customary for nearly 3,000 years up to this point. When the barbarians came upon Varus' body, they cut off his head and delivered it to Arminius. Arminius, in turn, sent the head to the next most powerful chieftain in Germany with an offer to form an alliance. This chieftain, still spooked by Roman power and likely fearing Roman retribution, declined Arminius' offer and sent the head back to Rome. Of the battle, historian and contemporary of Varus and Arminius, Valius Paterculus, wrote, quote, An army unexcelled in bravery, the first of Roman armies in discipline, in energy, and in expertise in the field, through the negligence of its general, the perfidy of the enemy, and the unkindness of fortune was surrounded, hemmed in by forest and ambuscades. It was exterminated almost to a man by the very enemy whom it had always slaughtered like cattle. End quote. When the remaining two legions in Germany discovered the fate of their governor and his three legions, they evacuated, anticipating an attack by the swelling numbers controlled by Arminius. The archaeological evidence at the Roman base of Xanten does indeed show a hasty abandonment. Other Roman bases likewise evacuated back over the Rhine as well. When news reached Caesar Augustus about the loss of these three legions, he reportedly tore his clothes and while banging his head against the wall shouted, quote, Quintilius Verus, give me back my legions, end quote. And it's said that every year Augustus set aside a day of mourning for this loss. There's also something of an apocryphal story that when Augustus handed over the empire to Tiberius, he warned him not to venture back into Germany. Nonetheless, in the decades following the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, a Roman army under the very capable general Germanicus led a retaliatory campaign into Germany against Arminius. It was a long and brutal war, and the Germans suffered heavy losses, but in the end, Rome was never able to gain a foothold over the Rhine again. On his campaign, Germanicus' army came upon the old battlefield at Teutoburg. There they found the thousands of bleached white bones of their fallen brothers. Most of the remains still lay where the soldiers had died. Others showed signs of a cruel sacrifice and the trees around them still adorned with the skulls nailed to the trunks. Appalled at the sight, Germanicus ordered some of the remains to be buried, but they couldn't get to them all. They were just too scattered and too many, and they were still under the constant threat from Arminius. After the war, Arminius eventually married a German princess named Thusnelda, and they had a son together who, ironically, was kidnapped by the Romans, and his fate, unfortunately, is lost to history. We don't know what happened to him. As for Arminius, in A.D. 21, afraid of his growing power among the Germans, he was assassinated by rival chieftains, his own people. Amazingly, Emperor Tiberius had turned down an opportunity a few years earlier to have Arminius poisoned. When a Germanic chieftain made the offer, Tiberius responded by saying, quote, It was not by secret treachery, but openly and by arms that the people of Rome avenged themselves on their enemies. End quote. The Roman historian Tacitus recounts an incident during Germanicus's retaliatory campaign against Arminius, in which Germanicus's army stood on the banks of one side of a river, and Arminius stood on the other. And in an effort to pacify Arminius, they called forth his brother, Flavius, who had aligned himself with Rome. Tacitus says that Flavius argued across the river for his brother to give in, saying that, quote, Roman greatness the power of the Caesar, the heavy penalties for the vanquished, the mercy always waiting for him who submitted himself. Even Arminius's wife and child were not treated as enemies, end quote. But, according to Tacitus, Arminius, shaming his brother's treachery, shouted back that, quote, the sacred call of their country, their ancestral liberty, the gods of their German hearths, and their mother who prayed with himself that he would not choose the title of renegade and traitor to his kindred, to the kindred of his wife, 
to the whole of his race, in fact, before that of their liberator. End quote. Further remembering Arminius, Tacitus writes, Undoubtedly the liberator of Germany, a man not in its infancy as captains and kings before him, but in the high noon of its sovereignty, threw down the challenge to the Roman nation. In a battle with ambiguous results, in war without defeat, he completed 37 years of life, 12 of power, and to this day is sung in tribal lays. Though he is an unknown being to the Greek historians, who admire only the history of Greece, and receives less than his due from us in Rome, who glorify the ancient days and show little concern for our own. Modern historians have debated how much part Arminius actually played in stemming the spread of the Roman Empire. They say that the Rhine was a very natural border regardless, and that there was nothing to gain by expanding into Germany any further. Now, I, I'm not a historian, so I'll leave those debates to them, but what is true is that before Arminius' trap in the Teutoburg Forest, the Romans were there, and after, they were not. Martin Luther actually had a lot to do with a resurgence in Arminius' popularity as a symbol of German identity in opposition to Rome, though I believe he incorrectly applied the name Hermann to him, thinking it to be a Germanic form of Arminius, but to my knowledge that's not the correct entomology of the name. Arminius was intentionally forgotten in German history books post-Nazi era due to an abhorrence toward anything resembling nationalism. And in 2009, it was the 2,000-year anniversary of the Battle of Teutoburg Forest, and it was celebrated with very little fanfare, which is kind of a shame when you think about it. If you think that my little show is worth a dollar, I'd very much appreciate you becoming a patron. By pledging a dollar a month, you get some behind-the-scenes access to works in progress. I also give out early access to new releases, and you also get a shout-out on the next episode. This really helps me offset the cost of running this thing, especially since I would really like it to remain ad-free. To be a patron, you can visit my site. It's right there. Uh, it's one of the first things you'll see when you scroll down um, at writteninbloodhistory.com or by going directly to my Patreon site, which is patreon.com slash writteninbloodhistory. On that note, I need to thank my Uncle Mike and Aunt Joni. They recently became patrons of the show, and I think they were particularly fans of my Notre Dame Almost episode. So thanks, guys. I really appreciate that. Every dollar helps. Apart from becoming a patron, we podcasters get our biggest jollies off of five-star reviews and ratings on wherever you listen. Seriously, that is the single biggest thing you can do to make our day. It is also hugely important in ratings and spreading the word about this little podcast. I need to express my gratitude toward author, archaeologist, and anthropologist Peter S. Wells for writing the book The Battle That Stopped Rome. He brings the archaeological discoveries over the past decades into a compelling narrative and served as the principal source for my episode. As always, I'll have a link to purchase his book in the show notes, and when you make a purchase through one of my links, I get a very tiny commission that goes towards the production of the podcast, but whether or not you use my link buy Peter's book. It's really awesome. I highly recommend checking it out. I also need to thank my sister Courtney for her awesome cover art that she does for this episode and many others. If you're looking for a freelance graphic artist, you can find her work at cjdejulius.myportfolio.com. The bumper music for this episode comes from Kevin McLeod at incompetech.filmmusic.io, and I'll have a link to his site in the show notes as well. If you want to get a hold of me, you can hit me up on Twitter. My handle is at sdijulius, that's S-D-I-J-U-L-I-U-S, or message me via the Written in Blood History Facebook group, or send me an email at stephen.dejulius at gmail.com. That's Stephen with a P-H. I love interacting with listeners and chatting about all things history or podcasting or whatever. I think that about wraps it up for the housekeeping items. So, as usual, 
Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to Written in Blood History. See you later.